morning. Good morning. Good to greet you in the name of the Lord. Glad you've <coughs> chosen to assemble with the Lord and each other in this place and trust that the gathering this morning will have meaning for your life and your spiritual journey. So if you'll please turn to 605, I'll read the first paragraph. If you'll read the second paragraph, and then together we'll read the third. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and known of God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sends His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. If you'll please turn to 609, leaning on the everlasting arms, and join me in seeing the first, second, and third verse. stand up on the level. If you want to come up here by me, you sure can. But let's welcome the Apple Corps singers. Jesus. 
Thank you. Here's what Paul writes. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Today is probably going to be more of a history lesson, but it will help us enter into this book of Philippians with an understanding of this great servant, the Apostle Paul. Next week we'll dwell into the first 11 verses, so I encourage you to read that text a couple of times this week and reflect on it as we think about the wonderful relationship the Apostle Paul had with the Christian community in Philippi. I have often thought, many years ago I wrote a series of lessons for Standard Publishing Company from Philippians, and I call this first chapter, Paul with the Lid Off. He really tells something about his own love of God and others. And as a pastor, I identified with that, and I do so again as we enter into this series. It was A.D. 52. That's even before Herb Leish. <laughs> That's a long time ago. And it wasn't the spirit of Brownville that left the shore. It was another ship leaving Troas and sailing toward Neapolis. Travelers on that ship included New Testament church leaders, such as the Apostle Paul, and his missionary friend, Silas, and Luke, the physician and writer. I think Luke was there because of the physical needs of Paul, as well as his love of the Lord. And I think he brought strength to the apostle in his last years. And also accompanying was Paul's youngest servant, Timothy. These men are really important to you. They brought Christ to all of Europe through their beginning outreach. And that eventually came to the United States. And it even came to our community of Brownville. For 4,000 years, Asia had been the cradle of the human race. And now that center of activity was moving to Europe. As Paul set sail on his second missionary journey, we'll read how his hope was to return to all these churches he had visited on his previous trip. Those were churches that he 
and Silas and others had begun. We learn he was forbidden to go to Asia. He was forbidden to go to north in the northeast to Bithynia. I don't know how that vision came to him that he should not enter, but that was the way he saw the door closing. And while he was in Troas, Paul had a vision in which he saw a man over in Macedonia urging him to come and help the people there. Now, I, I've not had that kind of vision, but I came to Brownville. And I was working in a messy yard at the time. I don't know if you remember how bad that corner looked, but it was a little embarrassing from my point of view. And I'd invested in that old house and probably only God knew why. Uh, and someone came up to me while I'm working in the yard trying to clean it up a little bit. And the call was rather simple. I understand you're a preacher, the man said. It wasn't a man from this church. He was just a man in the community. And I said, well, some people say I was. And he said, well, the little Christian church up the street hasn't been able to secure a pastor. Would you mind filling in for them? And I said, well, I think I could help. I come down quite often on weekends, so I can do that for a little while. And here we are. Do you know how long that's been? 29 years. I can't even hardly believe that. I can still see myself in that messy yard. <laughs> so your call as a pastor or a call of God as a servant as to where you would be, it really depends a lot on God and the individual. And mine was very simple. Paul's was more dramatic. And Paul's response to the vision he had was, now after he had seen the vision, we immediately sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. And who wrote those words? His good friend and physician, Luke. Paul and his team left Troas, by way of the most direct route to the seaport city of Neapolis and from there to the most important city in Macedonia and it was a wealthy city and a prosperous city it was called Philippi and the map on the back of the bulletin will show you its location it was about nine miles from the Aegean Sea Philippi was a Roman colony, don't forget that. And when they arrived, they did not find a synagogue. Paul had been working very hard in the Jewish community because he knew it well from his past. But this time, it was harder to find the Jewish people to help present to them the gospel and to the Gentiles. You see, you needed 10 men of Jewish faith in that culture to form a synagogue. So that meant Philippi didn't have very many Jewish people. And that was where Paul usually started his outreach presenting Christ. 
On the Sabbath, they assembled at the riverside. They had learned that there were Jewish worshipers, particularly women, who had been gathering regularly there for prayer. And as a result of that first meeting, Lydia, a merchant woman, she was a seller of purple cloth, was converted to Christ and was immediately baptized. In gratitude for what the Lord had done in her life, she said to Paul and to the others, Silas and Timothy and Luke, stay in my house. We can meet there. It'll be a place of lodging. We'll be emphasizing this a great deal. I, there's always an issue over in our culture of where women fit in the life of the church. I want you to notice that the first European church began with the conversion of a woman who offered her home and she was wealthy and she provided for them in those early moments when Christ was being preached in Philippi. Certainly there's a place for women's ministry and that's evident to me by what transpired in this city. As soon as it was evident, the Lord was blessing their efforts. And as soon as that happened, what happens when you start to grow? Well, Satan has a way of bringing opposition. It just happens. I've observed it. I can remember the church in Lincoln. We were really finally beginning to, br to grow. And things were happening. And we had gotten a new building. And then we added on an additional building. And it was really happening. And we were now into multiple services. And I was inspired and challenged by all of that. When suddenly a group of people from another church decided to come and unite with our church. And we were welcoming them, and we did. But all oh, it became divisive, almost to the point of destruction. I remember meetings with the elders. I remember inviting Dr. Lown from Manhattan Christian College. I remember meeting with Brother Harold Milliken from Nebraska Christian College. And they came and visited with our elders and with me to try to help us to keep from dividing and being disruptive. It's always, it always seems to be a temptation and Satan has a way of sometimes just interrupting the growth and the pattern of Christianity. How thankful I am that that church never divided. A slave girl began, I don't, I don't know what I'd do if I had this happen to me, following these preachers around. And everywhere they went, she, the scripture says, she loudly announced that these servants had a mission. And she would announce to everybody that they had a mission for Christ. And within a short time, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul did a tough job, but he did it. He cast out a demon. You'll read that in the name of Jesus Christ, he spoke to her, and she too was converted. The men who owned the girl and used her for their personal gain because she could foretell certain things. And they got so upset with Paul and Silas, into the jail they went. 
And they were so upset to them that the jailer put them in the inner prison, scripture says, after they had beat them. And they put their feet in stocks. And they were under secure guard. At midnight, what do you do at midnight when you're in prison? Well, Paul and Silas sang. Now, I've heard singing that would cause an earthquake. This place did shake. Sometimes singing isn't everything we want it to be. But it wasn't that that caused the earthquake. And they were praying. And an earthquake came. And all of the prison doors were open. The stocks were broken. The jailer heard the commotion. He ran to the prison and concluded that the prisoners had escaped. And because he came to that conclusion, he took out his sword to take his own life. And Paul saw what was about to happen and shouted to the jailer, don't harm yourself. We're still all here. And as a result, the jailer and his household were united with Christ that night and were baptized. You notice when they were baptized at the midnight hour, they did it right away. And the church in Philippi is growing. Now I want you to just look at this with me. How's this for a nucleus? A woman merchant that was very wealthy, a slave girl who had to have a demon cast out of her, and a jailer and their families. That's quite a nucleus. Ten years after founding this church, <clears throat> Paul sits down and writes to them. And three times in this letter, you will note that he thanks them for their gift that they sent to him by a man named Epaphroditus. And Paul hoped to encourage them and share some corrective concerns because he knew that a spirit of division was developing among them. And he has admonished them to be united. He wrote them concerning the second coming of Jesus and concluded what he wrote them with encouraging words. Paul had joy in his heart for this community of faith. And though Paul is a prisoner when he writes this letter, he sure was thankful for, for the Philippian Christians. Paul knew Christ was at work in their lives. If you read it carefully, you'll note the letter begins with Christ and the letter ends with Christ. I understand that. I'm so thankful that I came your way and that a gentleman called Roberta Smith and said, there's a fellow that would preach if you want him. I want you to know you're the only church who never voted on me. <laughs> I don't know if you regret that or not, but please don't tell Steve Kennedy. <laughs> it was a wonderful beginning. It was a tough beginning. We didn't know if we'd make it. We had thoughts, and I certainly had thoughts, of how do you conclude a church ministry with dignity. I kept studying the scriptures to try to figure out what it is maybe I should be doing that I'm not doing. Those 
It happened again and again. I remember coming to meetings and we discussed that among a few of us who worshiped here. But I can identify to a great extent with this wonderful servant, Paul, who had joy in his heart. Cornelia Jones would play a piano sitting right over here. Connie Bridgewater would bring her every Sunday. We sang the same hymns every Sunday. We sang the same opening every Sunday. Because Cornelia could only play a couple, three songs. So we re repeated. It wasn't very uplifting at the time, probably, for any of us. But her faithfulness was so appreciated and Connie's willingness to bring her meant a great deal to me, I can tell you that. That's how it began. I preached the first year from right down here. I could get face to face with Brenda, and maybe I should. <laughs> but it was a close relationship. There were just a handful of us. That's how it all began. So you know what the joy is for me today? That you're all here. Suddenly, it wasn't sudden, but soon Jody and Charlie invested in property. And I had known them through Lincoln. And I knew of their gifts, their talents. And for some reason, we all felt comfortable. And they have been worshiping with us and serving the Lord in music ever since. I have them in my heart. I never worry about what's going to happen at the piano. I should have, knowing what she did in Lincoln. <laughs> Their ministry has blessed a lot of us. And I see you go up and thank her. And I'm grateful that you appreciate what she does or what Charlie has done through the years. And I appreciate the loyalty of that early nucleus that kept us going, even when the going was hard. In those days, it was all we could do to pay our bills. We had to have special drives. Fish fries were pretty common. The women did hard work at flea markets. It was not an easy moment, but God has blessed our ministries together. And so we'll read what I think was an important phrase in the life of the Philippians and Paul. And it has been for me when he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. My prayer is that Christ will grow in your hearts and lives beyond where we have come. And I trust that in all of this, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ will be with us all. Let's sing our closing hymn of commitment today page four. Let's stand as we say.